Uh, thank you. Uh, we're here this morning in the case of uh, Hank Dennis Hankerson versus William Hankerson. It's our case number CACV 150109. Uh, we've allocated 20 minutes to each side. Um, appellant, counsel for appellants responsible for reserving whatever time you'd like for, for rebuttal. Uh, these proceedings are being audio and video recorded, uh, so we would ask that you identify uh, yourself and the name of your client when you approach the podium. Uh, we have conferenced this matter after um, after reading the briefs and, and studying the record. Uh, we hope we're familiar with the uh, with the facts. Uh, and with that, we'll look forward to your argument. You may proceed. Good morning, Your Honors. My name is Kevin Meyer from the firm of Broning Oberg, Woods and Wilson, here representing appellant Dennis Hankerson. This appeal concerns three rulings by the Superior Court. Uh, first of all, the summary judgment with respect to the sales expenses. Second, the summary judgment with respect to the promissory note. And three, the award of attorney's fees, or excuse me, the award of uh, expert fees um, as a uh, taxable cost. All three are error and two require reversal of this uh, judgment. We respectfully submit that um, this court can rule as a matter of law that the expert fees uh, are incorrect and should not be reconsidered on reconsideration. But we do believe that reconsideration will be necessary certainly to allocate the, um, the actual sales expenses, but also to consider the tort claims based on the promissory note. The first issue is the sales expenses summary judgment. And at issue were expenses that happened at the selling of certain members' interests in the two companies, two, juice, two deuces and jackpot. And it's undisputed that those, uh, the expenses at issue, these, these sales expenses, had to do with the winding down of these uh, companies and the selling of, selling of these members' interests. So the trial court had two summary judgments pending before it. There was Dennis Hankerson's summary judgment, which asked for a determination that uh, of liability of who should pay these sales expenses, leaving the actual allocation of which expenses constituted a sales expense uh, for the trier of fact. And then there was the opposing summary judgment motion, which actually asked for a determination that none of these expenses should be borne by the manager at all. So the trial court granted the motion for the manager in its entirety, disregarding the plaintiff's theory that sales expenses uh, were to be borne by the manager based on the language of the document. And it did so even though the defendant conceded, and this concession is repeated at page 33 of the answering brief, that some costs allocable directly to the sales of the company and some costs were not. And we'd submit on that basis alone that there's clear error. But we really want to make sure the court understands our uh, argument as to why judgment as a matter of laws is appropriate for the plaintiff's position that sales expenses are supposed to be borne by the manager. And again, when we talk about the sales expenses, what we're talking about is uh, the document that you can find at uh, page 139 of the appendix, the joint appendix in brief. And on that page, prepared by the manager, the words sales expenses are used again. Now on appeal, they can see that that's a poor choice of words, but that's really what this comes down to. It, who pays the sales expenses? And plaintiff's position is simple. It, it comes down to 11 words, and those 11 words are found in section 5.6.7. And that's 5.6.7 of the operating agreement, 5.6.7 of the agreement for two deuces, and 5.6.7 of the agreement for jackpot. And those 11 words read, sales expenses of any kind shall be borne by the managing general partner. And so we believe that that clause is clear, plain, specific, and has an unambiguous meaning that sales expenses of any kind are to be borne by the manager. In this case, the sales expenses clearly were, contribu or were attributed to the companies and were taken out of the members' uh, eventual um, payments out uh, from the closing. So there's a clear discrepancy in how this was handled. Why would that type of provision be placed in there? What, is that typical to, 
to require the manager to to bear all of the expenses? Why, why is that? It, it seems a little bit counterintuitive that you would expect that the manager would bear all of the expenses of the sale. You might, uh, your honor is correct, you might uh, consider that to be a little unusual, but the agreement is a little unusual in itself. And I think if you look at the other um, expenses and cost allocation within 5.6, you'll see that in 5.6.5 and 5.6.6, expenses in general are, are being attributed to the general manager, whereas costs are being allocated between the members and the company. And again, um, with respect to 5.1.7, the expenses related to the initial offering, those also are being borne by the member. So at any point in which you're seeing expenses in the agreement, those expenses are being allocated to the, to the managing partner. And so we believe that is consistent with the rest of the agreement and really does not um, invite the opportunity for construction because when the, the document is plain on its face, no construction is necessary. Does that make 5.1.7 uh, re 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 redundant? It doesn't because 5.1.7 is specific to the uh, actual initial offering. And um, although, although it certainly is, is general and would encompass that anyway, um, you have some clauses that are specific and some clauses that are general. But we, then we try to, to read uh, contracts to not, then we read them just like statutes and try not to make, read it in such a way that certain provisions are superfluous. I agree with your honor's position, and, and certainly, you know, if there was any question as to whether what we would do with the initial offering expenses, I think that's clear that 5.1.7 would apply. But when you have language that is this broad and repeated throughout the document, that expenses of any kind are to be borne by the manager, it would seem appropriate that that's exactly what the parties meant. And it's clear that that. Well, but doesn't that open a question, and it should be handled by the trial court, and not by us. We believe that the document is plain on its face and unambiguous and, and doesn't require uh, additional sources to, to construe it. Um, and certainly the, uh, the trial court did consider the parole evidence, and, and that's clear from the court's ruling. I know that um, our opponents have suggested that it wasn't necessary to do that, but it, the plain language of the court's ruling is, is clear that parole evidence was considered. Uh, we believe that the only reasonable interpretation, because in every instance the manager is the manager is the party that is bearing the expense, that our position is correct and that we're entitled to judgment as a matter of law. However, even though. It even though that interpretation renders, uh, renders at least one provision superfluous. I don't think it does render it superfluous. I think you just have a general and specific, but I think to answer your question more broadly, in the worst case scenario for our position, summary judgment was inappropriate because there are competing theories that should have gone to the jury for resolution. Thank you. Unless there are further questions on that point, I'd like to address the promissory note. And again, just for the briefest bit of background, um, all of the remaining tort claims that plaintiff had asserted had to do uh, with the promissory note as an element of, of allegation. So uh, the parties agreed and the court decided to resolve the issues uh, related to the promissory note and its interpretation uh, as the way of resolving the, the remaining claims on summary judgment. Uh, what happened is that you had uh, these investment companies, Two Deuces and Jackpot, investing in oil and gas, and the members were able to make contributions, their contributions to the investment, through a combination of cash and promissory note. And the, what's at, at issue in this case is that uh, Bill Hankerson, as the uh, managing partner, issued a promissory note that was inconsistent with the remaining terms of how promissory notes were supposed to be issued uh, to make their actual contributions. Uh, essentially, Bill got to make a, a promissory note that was unpaid for 17 years rather than the members who had six months at best to make their payments under the note. And he received distributions from the company throughout those 17 years. And only at the end, when million dollars, millions of dollars were available, did he finally pay off his note. And again, all of those facts are undisputed. The question is whether, as a matter of law, that constitutes a basis for a claim for a breach of fiduciary duty. And what we have in this case is, is the idea of preferential treatment, but also non-disclosure. 
The facts are that we, uh, that Dennis Hankerson did not receive a copy of the note even until uh, the second litigation, uh, the second lawsuit in this litigation. So there, there was non-disclosure. This was not something that was recorded and reported to the members, so they weren't able to exercise their judgment and either affirm the decision or uh, question the managed position. But based on that, we believe that there are questions of fact regarding whether the, uh, the unfair treatment and, and the preferential treatment that the manager showed himself compared to his uh, investors that he was charged with uh, taking care of constitutes a basis for a claim for breach of fiduciary duty. And to the extent that there are questions of fact, again, the Superior Court made an error in granting summary judgment. And how, how were they damaged by the... Uh, they were damaged um, basically as, as set forth in the Geithner report. Um, that that's, uh, sets forth uh, how the distributions were affected and also the ability to control uh, what the actual management decisions being made by the manager. So, how, how much was he required, in your view, was he required to have uh, submitted in, in cash in addition to the promissory note? <clears throat> Well, I think that's a question of fact for the court as well. But the, the fact that there was no contribution, I think, is, is by itself a basis There's for the reverse. There's a $5 reverse. contribution. Do you have a claim? Well, I mean, the, the trial court sort of recognized the difference and with respect to the issue of interest. And the court uh, recognized that, uh, again, to the extent that there was a promissory note uh, and uh, – the terms were, were cleared, uh, the note was being paid at 1.5% interest as opposed to 10% interest. And the court set aside that issue as well, but um, the, the Geithner report provides more than sufficient evidence to talk about damages, and, and that's before the court, and, and it should have been judged on that basis. So your argument helped me understand the basis. It seems to me that there are three possible bases for the argument that a note, whatever its terms, w was improper. Um, a statutory prohibition, a prohibition in the contractual relationship, operating agreements and other documents, or some external independent obligation that is neither statutory nor contractual. Now, there may be other things in the universe, but I can't think of them right now. What is the basis for this specific claim of those three sort of options? Uh, of the three options, it would be the second, Your Honor, it would be the, the contract language. Uh, there is a specific provision in the agreement that imposes a fiduciary duty on the, um, on the general manager, and that's Section 8.6, and you can find that uh, on pages 38 and 39 of the opening brief or page 487 of the appendix. And, again, if you look at the terms of the uh, – of the contract and the operating agreements and what the, ma the members were having to contribute under their terms and what the manager was set aside for himself, uh, there's a disparity there. And again, you only need to look at the fact that the Superior Court recognized that the interest difference that the uh, manager was paying versus what the uh, members were paying, and that's set aside. That's actually not part of the appeal, but that's in that minute entry uh, on the same issue. Uh, again, shows a disparate uh, practice. So with the fiduciary duty that that you claim is imposed by the party's contracts, could the could the could the terms of contribution vary at all, or did they have to be the same? I, I think they could have varied, and I guess part of the issue here is the lack of disclosure. I think that if the um, subscription had been reported to the members, and the members had had an ability to actually either ratify that or um, you know, make some decision uh, as to whether they thought that was appropriate and that they were being managed appropriately. Arguably, there may not have been a, a, a breach of the fiduciary duty, but the fact that they were not, again, speaks to the fact that there was a, a breach of that duty. So to restate your argument, it is it, they had to be identical unless they were disclosed and approved. I think that's fair. And what's the source for that? What's the basis for that argument? Well, the cases we cited, the uh, Thurston case and the Tagger case, talk about um, treating uh, treating the person charged with the fiduciary duty uh, in a preferential um a preferential light. Again, that's on page 38 of the opening brief. But it, and what it, it, is there contractual language that you're suggesting was breached or you're just saying it's this overall the breach of fiduciary duty that you have to, you can't treat yourself better than, than anyone else? I, I think that's the legal duty at issue. Um, whether there are um, issues about um, the specific terms and, and whether there could be some variance on that point, I think is something that would be a question of fact for the court. But, but the, the simple fact of the matter is there was a disparate treatment, and that, that part is undisputed. But, and that. but don't operating agreements 
oftentimes treat sort of managing members or managing general partners different? I think they can, and if it had in this case, I think that would be appropriate. But that's that's not the record we have here. Um, and, and again, to the extent that there was any question about that, a, a proper disclosure would have uh, allowed the, the parties to all know what's going on and be able to be approved of that. But your argument is not that the operating agreements prohibited this. It's that the fiduciary duty re obligation required the managing general partner, whatever the term was, to do something more or different. Is that fair? <laughs> Let me let me ask you a better question. Is okay. there a specific provision in the in the parties operating agreements that would preclude contribution by a promissory note? A specific one, apart from fiduciary right. obligation. No, uh, promissory notes were recognized as a possible form of contribution. Um, the, the specific uh, basis on which those terms are set and the, and the repayment structure and how they, um, whether they're entitled to receive contributions or, excuse me, distributions before that's paid are, all, again, all specific terms, and it's the combination of those factors that is the issue. But if, it, if there's not a problem, then it, there's no violation of any provision in the agreement by accepting a promissory note rather than cash. It's simply, you're mainly focusing on the disclosure that someone would have complained or? Certainly there are provisions of the agreement that focus on cash contributions and that should could be interpreted to suggest that more cash was needed or the, the proper ratio of cash to promissory notes. But I think those are questions of fact that would need to be flushed out before the Superior Court. But people were treated differently, that repayment was different based on whether someone had contributed cash as opposed to a promissory note. I'm sorry, Ms. I, uh, no, let me correct the record. Once everyone's contribution was made, they were entitled to receive distributions. Um, with respect to the members, they had six months to pay their promissory notes. Bill uh, Hankerson didn't pay his promissory note for 17 years and yet continued to receive distributions throughout that period of time. And if he had repaid the promissory note, what, how would that have changed anything for all of the other members? I, I think this, the simple issue is that the manager does not get to benefit from uh, the contribution of the investments without making his contribution. And to the extent that he's uh, able to do that, he hasn't actually put up and made his contribution, uh, and yet is still receiving the benefit of everyone else's collective benefit uh, contribution. And, and that's a, a disparate impact. Uh, it's it's an um, it's preferential treatment that he's receiving a benefit for which he hasn't contributed. And with respect to the pleadings or disclosures, where would I find an assertion that that the breach of fiduciary was based on the difference in the party's promissory notes as opposed to improper distributions or otherwise? Uh, you would find that um, in our disclosures and also in our response to the um, motion for summary judgment, which is instrument 55. Before I sit down, I'd like to address, quickly address the issue of expert witness fees. It's clear in this case that about approximately $35,000 was awarded on, uh, for the payment of expert accounting fees. Uh, the general rule is that expert fees are not um, taxable costs. Only the costs uh, set forth in three, uh, 12, 332 are taxable, um, and to do so otherwise is an abuse of discretion. That's the Schrader case. Um, subsection 6 of, the, uh, of that statute recognizes that an agreement between the parties could be a basis for awarding costs, but the Parrish case and the Reyes case make clear that that agreement has to be separate and apart from an operating agreement between the parties. It has to be specific to the litigation. Um, in any event, if this court were to consider the operating agreement to be a basis for uh, for imposing the cost. If you look at sections 9.1, 9.1.1, and 9.1.2, it's clear that the operating agreement has a duty to, of indemnity going from the company to the member. It does not run opposite. It is not an a, a obligation on the member to reimburse the company for litigation. So even if the operating agreement could serve as the basis of that agreement, um, the language of that uh, agreement does not support that ruling in this case. Unless the court has further questions, I'll reserve the balance of my time. Thank you. Good morning. Dennis invested $216,000 in two oil and gas programs, jackpot and two deuces, which were managed by Bill's company, Hankerson Management. Ultimately, Dennis received approximately $1.9 million, or approximately an 875% return on his investment. 
Instead of thanking his brother Bill, Dennis sued his brother Bill and or Bill's companies three times with three resulting appeals using three different attorneys and three different accounting experts. Dennis has never obtained a finding by any superior court of any wrongdoing in any of these cases as against Bill Hankerson or his companies. And despite uh, Dennis's solicitation of all of the other investors in these programs to join him in his litigation against his brother Bill, none of them did so, and Dennis is the only one who has sued Bill on these various uh, charges that are the subject of his lawsuits. This appeal today is arising out of Dennis's third lawsuit. I will discuss the two main issues, sales expenses and the promissory note on which the trial court granted summary judgment in Appley's favor. Next, I will discuss the accounting fee issue. And finally, if time permits, I would like to touch upon some of the additional legal grounds for affirming uh, summary judgment. Let me discuss first the sales expense issue, the $6,700 issue. This is a total matter of $103,504 for all of the investors, or as to Dennis Hankerson, $6,721. Dennis argues that he's entitled to an additional $6,700 because Hankerson Management chose to allocate 80% of alleged sales expenses to two deuces and jackpot, and thus their members, including Dennis, instead of allocating all sales expenses to the manager. Dennis's argument is based solely on Section 5.6.7 of the operating agreement, which states sales expenses of any kind shall be borne by the manager. Now, in order to decide this issue, you must first decide what constitutes sales expenses under Section 5.6.7. So what constitutes a sales expense under that section? In order to determine this, you should do a couple of things. First, you should apply Arizona's rule of contract interpretation, which follows the Corbin view, divining the purpose of the agreement from the entire instrument and the surrounding circumstances, Darner Motor Sales. Arizona, as explained in the Taylor case, has a more permissive approach to admitting parole evidence and in interpreting contracts. In other words, Arizona courts are not restricted to the four corners of an agreement and may admit extrinsic evidence to interpret and understand the agreement uh, under certain circumstances. Dennis argues that the sales expense is undefined because it is not capitalized and there is no definition for the exact phrase sales expenses, and therefore it means what it says, sales expenses of any kind. Dennis is mistaken given the plain language of the contract as a whole and the applicable parole evidence. Section 5.1.7, which is the, from the definition section in Section 5 on distributions and allocations, defines certain selling expenses as selling expenses paid for services in connection with and expenses with the distribution of the offering. Now, how do we know Section 5.1.7 applies to 5.6.7? First, Section 5.1.7 merely serves as a definition section under Section 5 and does not have any application of its own. Second, the only provision that Section 5.1.7 could possibly provide a, a definition for and that remains undefined is 5.6.7. If 5.1.7 did not define sales expenses under Section 5.6.7, then 5.6.7 would be without any definition, thereby allowing any expense to constitute a sales expense. On the other hand, Section 5.1.7, whose sole purpose is merely to provide a definition for selling expenses, would be rendered meaningless contrary to Arizona rules of contract interpretation to construe a contract in its entirety, give purpose to every part, not render any part superfluous, and to harmonize all parts. Third, the definitions in Section 5.1 as a whole are listed in almost the exact same order and are parallel to how they are listed in Section 5.6 on allocation of costs and revenues, which indicates how those defined costs will be allocated. Those conclusions that I've just discussed are also bolstered by the parole evidence that was considered by the court. 
It was the intention and interpretation of the parties who drafted the operating agreement, including Hankerson Management's securities attorney, David Dobbs, and Bill, that Section 5.6.7 would only apply to sales expenses related to the initial offering as defined by 5.1.7. Who properly makes that decision? Is that a decision for the trial court without a jury, or is that a decision for the jury to decide? When there are competing views um, of what the same language says and parole evidence is necessary or is deemed necessary to, cons to determine what those mean. Well, for, first, uh, Judge Schumer, thank you. I, I don't think that the court explicitly said in its ruling that it considered parole evidence, and the parole evidence uh, wasn't offered to uh, was it to offer to change the uh, interpretation of the provisions or to... Uh, nor, nor could it be. Right. Um, but it, you're, you're talking about how parole evidence under Darner and State Farm versus Taylor and undoubtedly other cases properly should instruct what these terms mean or may mean. Who makes that decision? Uh, we believe it's a question of law because uh, a reasonable uh, fact finder could not reach a conclusion uh, applying the agreement as a whole uh, without ignoring the uh, Arizona established uh, rules of contract construction. Otherwise, part of the problem is not only you leave Section 5.1.7 without a purpose, you also potentially render the other provisions of 5.1 and those of 5.6 uh, conflicting. And I understand your argument on that point, um, but if that's the case, what's the, what's the proper role for parole evidence at all? Uh, it's been a while since I read State Farm versus Taylor, but I thought that case kind of contemplated a two-step where the trial court from the bench would decide whether external evidence needed to be considered at all in construing uh, a contract and what it may mean. And then the second step, if it did deem such evidence admissible, uh, perhaps a finder of fact would make the call on on how it should be construed. I think, Judge Thuma, my understanding is that the first part of the test is that the judge looks at the proffered evidence and decides whether uh, that evidence is reconcilable with the plain language of the agreement, and if it is, then the judge can consider it as evidence as to what the surrounding circumstances were that the parties intended under the agreement. And, and I, 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 we may be saying similar things, um, but if we are, and recognizing we're here on summary judgment, um, your position is, I'm gathering, that the jury has no role in any of this ever. Simply because this, in my view, was a matter of legal contract construction that uh, Judge Brain uh, concluded uh, could not reasonably inter be interpreted in a different way, considering these provisions as a whole, without rendering some of them meaningless or in conflict. And if that's the case, though, do we ever go to what the drafter thought or, you know, do we ever get to parole evidence under your, your theory? Um, I my my sense of it is is that if the evidence is consistent with and not contrary to the judge can consider it as reinforcing of his conclusions concerning the contract. But I, I would note out of clarity, you're, you're suggesting the, some of the the evidence is your client's intent uh, that this is this was at least that's what you've you've discussed right. here that that's this is clearly what he intended. I mean, doesn't the other side get to? Uh, challenge whether that was actually the intent or say that's not credible. Um, why can you use that without submitting it to the fact finder? If, you, if you're going to say that this, this is this is significant and this confirms that this is the meaning of the, the language in the agreement, why don't they get a chance to, to dispute that before the trier of fact? Well, I, I think first we would suggest that 5.1 uh, 5.6.7 is not a legitimate competing view given 5.1.7 alone. And uh, I would just refer to the Taylor case uh, where it indicates um, on it indicates that the better rule is that judges first consider the offered evidence, and if he or she finds the contract language is reasonably susceptible to the interpretation asserted by its proponent, the evidence is admissible to determine the meaning intended by the parties. 
I also would just point out to the court. But, that but let me ask you about that. That's right. But isn't that sort of a literal parole evidence rule? What evidence comes in for the finder of fact to consider? Well, first of all, I mean, I, I would point to the we, we may be jumping the gun here because the minute entry of the judge indicates that uh, with respect to this issue, it, it says I, I believe in here it indicates that he can it doesn't indicate that he necessarily considered the affidavit. So so I don't know that there is anything in the record to indicate that his decision was necessarily based upon the admitted affidavits to the extent that that presents the court with a concern. If there are no further questions, let me address the promissory note issue. I think it's significant that in their pleadings, the uh, plaintiffs only alleged that the loan was improper under the operating agreement and that there were no distributions uh, permitted without payment. Uh, and many of the arguments that have been raised either in the summary judgment motion or, and continued or expanded upon in the appeal were not properly pled, and thus we would allege or assert not properly considered at this level. I also would submit that it's important to remember that the manager's role is different than that of the member investors. The member investor's role is to provide capital for the company, whereas the manager's role is to provide management for the company. And I would suggest it's significant if we look at the actual operating agreement and the sections uh, 3.1 and 3.3 in, in regarding the initial contributions. Under 3.1, as we pointed out in our briefs, uh, the provision says each member has paid or conveyed to the company's contribution. And then under 3.3 for manager, it says the manager shall make contributions to the capital of the company with respect to its manager's interest in the company. And then it goes on to say in the second sentence, at all times during the existence of the company, the manager shall have a present and continuing interest in net profits, net losses, and distributions and allocations. Um, in, if you interpret the language of 4.2 as do the plaintiffs to suggest that it applies to the manager, which, by the way, the language of 4.2 is very clear. It just applies to the members. But if you attempt to reconcile that with 3.3, there is no reasonable conclusion but that the uh, manager's contribution was not required to be uh, made up front. And moreover, the Arizona law under limited partnerships and and uh, and limited liability companies allowed for a promissory note as a contribution for an interest in a limited liability company. Moreover, nothing in the operating agreement precluded a promissory note as a contribution on the part of the manager. A few other facts are notable. First of all, the promissory note was an enforceable promise to pay money to two deuces by Mr. Hankerson. Uh, moreover, the note uh, was fully paid in uh, November of 2007, months before the uh, bulk of the assets were liquidated in, I believe, June of 2008. Uh, and thus, uh, there is no material or economic impact to any of the investors, including uh, Dennis, uh, because of the fact that he paid it in November of 2007 as opposed to some time in the previous time period. Let me address the accounting fees. If you could just, there's a discussion about a failure to disclose, a fiduciary duty. What was, were there requests for disclosure of information at, at some point? What, what was the framework for letting the other investors know uh, about the levels of contributions that uh, the managing partner had made? Well, uh, I, I, speaking of what's in the record, in 2008, when Mr. Hankerson brought the first of his three lawsuits, there were documents that were provided to him, including accounting documents, that made clear that Mr. Hankerson's uh, his investment commitment was in the form of a obligation to pay and that it was outstanding. So there was no attempt to hide that fact from him in any respect. Um, so it, hopefully that answers your question. Well, let me follow up on that. If I hear your opponent right, they're claiming it needed to be disclosed and ratified at some far earlier time. What's your response to that? That this uh, this 
need, this promissory note needed to be fulfilled or, or – The fact and terms, apparently, of the – and I'm repeating what I think I heard um, – of the uh, promissory note needed to be disclosed to the investing members and somehow ratified sometime long before a disclosure such as that? Well, first of all, that's not a contractual obligation set forth anywhere in the operating agreement. And Number I two, they, I think they put it under a fiduciary duty right. claim. Well, first of all, okay, let me address that. It's also, I was going to say, not any kind of material omission because of the uh, the amount of the uh, contribution and, and the non-impact upon uh, any of the investors. But with respect to the fiduciary duty part of it, again, under limited liability law, there is no fiduciary duty that's imposed upon a manager of a uh, limited liability company to its members, certainly not a manager of a manager of a limited liability company to its members. Uh, the only fiduciary duty that was provided in these programs was a fiduciary duty set forth in the operating agreement, which provided that the uh, – manager had to safeguard the property and funds of the company and to protect those from third parties. And when, when was the first request for information about the relative levels of cash that had been contributed? Well, that, that again, that wasn't the subject of a specific request. The documents that would have revealed that were provided in connection with the first of the three lawsuits so that would have been in 2008. There was never a, just a general request. We'd like to know how much cash has been contributed That's up, the, up until then. That is my understanding. Uh, let me now address the accounting fees issue. The trial court obviously awarded $30,805 in accounting fees to Appalese pursuant to contract, the party's operating agreement, not as taxable court cost. Uh, uh, Appalese's statement of cost submitted to the court specifically indicated that the accounting fees were sought under contract and not as a taxable cost. This is an issue that you, the Court of Appeals, should review for abuse of discretion as the trial court had wide latitude in assessing cost. We submit that you should uphold the trial court's award of accounting fees if it has any reasonable basis. Here, there was a reasonable basis for the award. The operating agreement, which was an agreement between Dennis and the LLCs in which he invested, specifically stated in Section 9.1 and 9.1.2, that the company, meaning Two Deuces and Jackpot, comprised of its members, including Dennis and his profit-sharing plan, shall indemnify the manager, including uh, Hankers, meaning Hankerson Management, or such other person, which would include Bill, against expenses, including without limitation accountants' fees. In other words, Dennis and his profit-sharing plan specifically agreed in the operating agreement which they signed to pay for Hankerson Management's accounting expenses as members of Two Deuces and Jackpot. Those accounting fees should not be shouldered by the successful Applees or by other investors in Two Deuces or Jackpot who chose not to in participate in Dennis's unsuccessful lawsuits. Counsel, let me ask you, if the phrase was or the clause was written a little differently, I'm right there with you, but it talks about the company indemnifying, uh, not a subset of the investors, not, you know, the investors who participated in litigation. So help me understand how you, how you get there. Sure. The, the company is the investors. And in, in, I, I, we don't know this, but Judge Brain may have been thinking in the context of let's, let's follow this through to its logical conclusion. The contract says that uh, the manager uh, is entitled to indemnification for the cost, including accountant's cost, incurred as a result of managing or operating the uh, limited liability company. Again, I'm with you there. It's oh, just a question of who, who's required right. to pay. Yeah, and, and I'm, I'm going to go there. And then the next step is, okay, if the, uh, if the court said, the company indemnifies that, then because the company is essentially concluded, what that would force Mr. Hankerson to do is then make a capital demand upon each of the members who in turn would presumably assert an indemnity claim against Dennis Hankerson because he's the one that created this that they didn't participate in. So ultimately the net result after a lot of litigation and expense would be the very same place we're at. And I, I, under, I understand and appreciate that. Now, let me ask you fairly, does the record support that that math went on in Judge Brain's mind? No, of course not. Thank you.
uh, I, it looks like I'm out of time. Thank you. Judge Thelma, I mentioned um, when you asked about preservation on the issue of the promissory note, I quoted uh, Instrument 55 to you. You can find the quotation for that on um, reply brief 21 and 22. Very quickly, with respect to the minute entry um, regarding the, um, the sales expense ruling, uh, this is on page 292. The court writes, the court's task is to construe the contracts consistently with the party's intent. It cites Taylor. It says, in determining the meaning of even apparently um, uh, unambiguous terms, the court must consider extrinsic evidence to determine whether the clause is uh, susceptible to alternative meanings, having reviewed the contracts and related evidence. The suggestion that the trial court did not base its decision based on the affidavits, I, I think, does not stand scrutiny. The trial court clearly considered the parole evidence. And in doing that, there may be a, a, uh, an argument that there are competing interpretations, but if there are competing interpretations, that should have been resolved by the superior or by the trier of fact. Uh, uh, very quickly, uh, you've heard the dollar amount described. Uh, that is disputed. Uh, Long, versus, uh, Long versus City of Glendale has cited Taylor. That's on page uh, 13 of the reply brief. You can't use the parole evidence to change the plain language of the meeting of the, of the contract. Uh, finally, uh, Judge Howard, your question about sur surplusage. Again, if you look at 5.6.5, that also deals with initial offering expenses. There is repetition throughout this contract, and the fact that there is does not mean that we should uh, do damage and violence to the, the uh, language of 5.6.7. Finally, I would just say that the accounting fees should have been brought as, account as damages to a counterclaim. There was a, uh, a counterclaim that was uh, raised in this case, and it was dismissed. Thank you. Thank you both for your arguments. Uh, we will take this matter under advisement and issue a decision in due course. And with that, we're adjourned.